Let's now rally round the flag, boy, to rally once again. Now being the battle cry of freedom, we will rally from the hillside, we'll gather from the plain. Strike till each armed foe expires. Strike for your altars and your fires. For the green graves of your sires, God and your native land. General Sterling Price's Proclamation to the People of Central North Missouri, December 1861. Welcome to Things You Should Know, Civil War Edition. Today we'll talk about the Battle of Wilson's Creek, located in Green and Christian Counties on August 10, 1861. It has been a long summer, and the Union soldiers from the earlier battle at Boonville and Carthage were in an unfortunate situation. U.S. Brigadier General Lyon had requested and was denied reinforcements, and supplies themselves were starting to be depleted. In addition, many of the Union troops had not been paid, they were not clothed appropriately, and were only supposed to be enlisted for 90 days, and that 90 days was coming to an end soon. Lyon decided to push through even though they were not going to receive any reinforcements. He divided his men into three forces. Two of the forces would march out on the night of August 9th for a dawn attack, while the third force would remain behind in Springfield to guard the remaining supplies. Of the two forces sent out to attack, Lyon led the largest, which was comprised of the 3rd and 5th Missouri Volunteer Infantry Regiments, numbering approximately 4,300 men. Meanwhile, Sigel took over the smaller force of 1,200 men, most of whom were the men from earlier battles that he fought with. Early on the morning of August 10th, the Union launched a surprise attack. Almost immediately, General Lyon's forces overwhelmed the Confederate troops there, forcing them backwards. Lyon secured the high ground, a ridge that would later be known as Bloody Hill. Unfortunately, Union hopes of a quick victory dissipated when the Pulaski, Arkansas Battery, a Confederate artillery unit, unleashed fire on the Union soldiers. This, this cannon fire slowed the Union troops down enough that Sterling Price, commander of the Confederate troops, was able to organize defensive lines. The fighting raged into the day. Both Union columns lost contact with each other. Sigel was successful with his smaller Union force at first and was able to drive into the Confederate rear. Siegel began pursuit of the Confederate cavalry unit that had been driven away by the artillery earlier. Unfortunately, he had to stop along Skeeg's branch, and while stopping there, Siegel failed to post guards on his left flank and left his left flank open to an attack. During this time, Confederate Commander McCulloch was able to rally several Confederate units, including the 3rd Louisiana Infantry and Missouri State Guard 3rd Division, to lead a counterattack against Siegel. In what seems to be a constant blunder, the Union Commander Siegel mistook Confederate Commander McCulloch's 3rd Louisiana unit for the 3rd Iowa Infantry, a Union infantry unit. The problem was the Iowa Union unit wore the same gray colored type of uniforms. Siegel withheld his fire until the last moment when they realized their mistake. Unfortunately, they had waited too long and Siegel's flank was demolished by the Confederate attack. Siegel's brigade was routed, losing four very valuable cannons. Siegel and his men fled the field and back across Wilson's Creek leaving General Lyon and his forces alone. With the eastern side of Wilson's Creek now firmly controlled by the Confederates, the momentum of the battle had shifted. During the fighting, Lyon had been wounded twice and his horse killed beneath him. Lyon commandeered another horse. Sadly, around 9.30 that morning, while leading the 2nd Kansas Infantry in a charge, Brigadier General Lyons was shot in the heart by a musket on top of Bloody Hill and killed. Lyon became the first Union general to be killed in the war. Lyon's second-in-command, Major Sturgis, assumed command of the entire Union force. He was able to beat back the Confederate attack and maintain a defensible position on Bloody Hill. However, Sturgis realized that the Union army was low in supplies and ammunition and were exhausted. He did not want to risk a rout, so he had his men pull back in an orderly withdrawal, giving the field to the Confederate army under Price and McCulloch. The end result was 1,317 Union casualties and approximately 1,230 Confederate casualties as well. Well, join us next time for the Battle of Drywood Creek, Vernon County, Missouri, on September 2nd, 1861.